All right. So now is the uh, favorite uh, time in my show where uh, I get to learn a whole lot of stuff uh, with the uh, guest expert uh, that we've got on. Today's guest expert uh, is a friend of mine. It's uh, And uh, we catch up with each other at least every fortnight, I think, if not uh, uh, more often. Uh, and uh, that's Kevin Hargraves. So uh, Kevin has a uh, uh, is a business owner. He's been in business for years and years and years. And um, one of his uh, hobbies, I suppose you call it, is to find broken businesses and uh, buy them, fix them up, and uh, sell them for a profit. So he's done that for a, a number of businesses, and he just seems to have this knack of being able to look at a business, uh, find out where things are going wrong, and being able to fix them uh, quickly, or sometimes not quickly, but being able to fix them uh, and uh, turn them, you know, sometimes loss-making businesses into highly profitable businesses. I happen to know some of the people that uh, Kevin has worked with as well. And um, uh, I've never seen anyone go from uh, uh, you know, normal business misery to uh, having a massive smile on his face and uh, really enjoying life as well too. So, you know, Kevin's one of those uh, people that uh, he may not look happy himself, but he certainly brings joy into other people's <laughs> into other people's uh, businesses and uh, into their lives as well too. So I don't know, he might be the happy coach, who knows, but uh, he certainly knows his, um, his stuff. So a bit of background about him, uh, as I say, he's been in uh, business for about 40 years um, and um, he studied under, anyone uh, remember a, a chap by the name of Michael Gerber? So if you've read his book, uh, his uh, book is The E-Myth uh, and he's written a, a number of books as well too. Uh, uh, he's uh, been a, a, a student of uh, Michael Gerber's and he's also written five books uh, himself as well too and uh, one of them ended up on Amazon as a, uh, a bestseller and uh, I know that we're probably going to get some uh, reviews uh, from um, uh, for the books for Kevin tonight from the, the chap that uh, bought them uh, this week from Joe that bought them this week so uh, Kevin now coaches uh, business owners on how to grow their businesses uh, exponentially. And he's here to talk to us tonight about uh, unlocking those hidden profits and uh, some of those numbers that will revolutionize uh, your business. So put your hands together and uh, let's welcome Kevin to the stage. Welcome, Kevin. Hello. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm sure you're going to learn some interesting things tonight. Uh, when I talk to business owners and I talk to them about their profit and loss, they, they really get a bit lost. I think they get their profit and loss and they look at it and go, hmm, made some money, that's okay. And they throw it in the bin, not not in the bin, but they file it deep. But you know what? Um, of all the businesses I've bought over the years, I learned that the profit and loss was the one thing I needed before I did anything. Because when I could go through that profit and loss, I could see if I could improve that business really quickly. So I'm going to share some of those things with you tonight. Um, I'm sure you'll find it interesting um and um yeah so um you know i work with any sort of business because the same rules i find work in every business there's some variations but in reality the same rules always work uh, so that's what i do so i'm going to share my screen in a minute and we're going to go through some interesting things and uh i hope you all enjoy it i'll ask you some questions as we go just type them in the chat box um, I'll just get you to type in one if you agree or two if you disagree, whatever. How's that sound? All right. Let's see if we can get this working. There I am. Look at that. So uh, this is about know your numbers, know your business. If you don't know the numbers in your business, you've got no idea where you're going. Uh, that's the book I wrote up there in the top left, um, How to Create Your Million Dollar Business Using Seven Explosive Strategies. That was an international bestseller. I've also written a book on this is Know Your Numbers and How to Find the Hidden Profits in Your Financial Statements. Um, and this is an interview I did for Small Business Breakthrough. So let's have a look what we're going to do today. Um, I think Nick's given you much, uh, much of my background, not all of it, but a little bit. Can't tell you everything, you know that. Uh, let's see if we can get this to move on. It doesn't want to move. There it is. It's working. So what we're going to cover today is there's only three numbers in your profit and loss statement that you can have a direct impact on as a business owner. Who knew that? So I'm also going to cover the three simple numbers that will increase your profit by 58%. Not only that, but you can do that this week. All right, that's pretty good. 
12 ways to instantly lower your overhead costs, six ways to lower the yield cost of goods, eight options for increasing the revenue in any business. And remember, knowledge equals profit. So this is a simple profit and loss statement. I've simplified it. Um, revenue or sales, some people call it income, cost of goods, which is obviously what it costs you for whatever you sell. Uh, gross profit uh, is the difference between your, your sales and your cost of goods. Gross uh, uh, profit percentage margin is the percentage, which is your gross profit divided by your revenue multiplied by 100. And overhead or expenses, which is normally probably got another dozen things on it, but we've just simplified it for today. And then we've got net profit margin. So let's go on. So here well, I've already explained some of this gross uh, revenue is that variables, which is your cost of goods can be variable because it'll depend on how much you sell. The more you sell, the more cost of goods you're obviously going to acquire. Uh, gross profit is the sales uh, minus the cost of goods. Gross profit margin is your gross uh, profit divided by your revenue multiplied by 100. Uh, and overheads are fixed costs. So these are costs that happen every month, whether you sell more or you don't. They're like your rent, your, uh, your labor, your uh, internet, your telephone, etc. Net profit is obviously your gross profit minus your costs and gross profit percentage margin is all there. So let's, um, let's ask you, there's only three of these numbers that can a direct impact on as a business owner. So um, who'd like to have a guess of what they are? Bob in the chat, I'm happy to, no, no one. Okay, well, I'm gonna tell you, the first one is your revenue. If you increase that, you can have a direct impact on that. And there's a lot of different ways. And I'm going to show you um, as we go through how you can do that. Cost of goods is the other one. So you can reduce or increase the cost of goods because both of those affect the gross profit. So the gross profit depends on the other two. So you, the gross profit, you can't have a direct impact on. Gross profit margin percentage, you can't have a direct impact on because it's always going to be a percentage of those two. The third one is your overhead and expenses. You can obviously have a direct impact on that and it then affects your bottom line and your net profit margin. So let's have a look what we can do with that, all right? Let's get this thing to go sometimes. Here we go. So here's a typical little profit and loss. So it's um, revenue of this business is uh, $500,000. I've done this for a year. Profit and loss can be any time. Can be a month, three months, six months, twelve months, whatever. But we're just going to do it on a on a yearly basis for this business. So this business could be a cafe or restaurant. It could be a jeweler. It could be a florist. It could be a, a supermarket down the road. It could be almost any type of business. If it's a if it's a business that's um, involved in just services like what I do, coaching or uh, what Nick does. Cost of goods will be very low. However, the other costs go up and it doesn't change as much as what people think. So let's have a look. So I wanna apply my 555 formula. So let's have a look at the revenue. It's $500,000. Who thinks we could reduce that? Oops, sorry. Who thinks we could increase that by 5%? If you think we could put one in the chat box for me. Nobody's here, no one thinks we can. Well, some do. Nick does. Amanda. Amanda. Uh, Armando. Sorry about that. Um, yep. Okay. So I'm going to show you that. So what about the cost of goods? Who thinks we could reduce the cost of goods by 5%? 5%. That's not a lot. Easy. Look at that. Easy. One, one, one. Very good. Yep. I'm going to show you in a minute what happens when we do that. And what about the overhead? You see, I've got these three numbers up uh, highlighted in maroon color. Who thinks we could reduce the overheads by 5%? Remember that's the rent, the, the, the telephone, the business insurance, the staff wages, etc. Yep. So, all right, let's have a look what happens when we do that. So have a look at this. Here's a profit and loss. We're increasing the revenue by 5%, lowering the cost of goods and the overheads by 5%. 
So the revenue is 500,000, we add 5% and we got 525,000. You all agree with that? 5% of uh, 500 is 25,000, so it makes it 525. Cost of goods, <coughs> excuse me, is 300,000. We take 5% 5 off, 5% 5 of 300 is 15,000, so that makes it 285. And have a look at what it does to the gross profit. It takes from 200 to 240,000, pretty amazing. And look at the gross profit percentage margin. It takes from 40 to 46%. Have a look at the overhead when we reduce it by 5%. We go from 125% of that is 6,000. Then we go down to 114,000. So let's look at what it does to the net profit. Remember the net profits, what's left in your bank, it's what you put in your pocket at the end of the year. Is that coming up? No, there it is. So it goes by 46, that increases by $46,000 profit. That's a 58% profit increase. And most business owners would kill to get that, don't you think? How easy would that be for you to do? You could go home and implement that all next week. However, when you work with me, we get a lot more than 5%, believe you me, and I'm gonna show you some of the ways we can do it. So let's start. PowerPoint doesn't like this uh, Zoom call for some reason. Okay, so let's look at overheads and fixed costs. So these are costs that incur regardless whether you make a sale or you don't. They just happen every month. So they're like the mortgage, the rent, the insurance, your utilities, office supplies, office salaries, general maintenance, advertising, your cleaner, automotive uh, expenses. Uh, fixed refers to the fact that they, the costs always reoccur every month. Typically remains constant despite sales volume. So the cost incurred to deliver what you sell, that's the cost of goods. Remember where that's the second one we, well, that's the, the middle one we looked at. The uh, expenses was the third one, but we, I'm just doing it back to front and I've got a reason to show you that. So the, these are the costs incurred to deliver what you sell. So it typically increases with sales volume. So as the more you sell, the higher your cost of goods are normally gonna go. So examples of cost of goods, labor, direct and contact, the contractual, materials, scrap and rework, packaging, distribution, shipping, commissions to salespeople. And the other one is, is purchases. So you might purchase things to sell. It depends on your business. I haven't put that in here, but purchases are important. That's another one. So they can increase. The total amount of sales or income for a reporting period prior to any deductions, that's your revenue. So I'm just doing an overview here for a bit. So this is a figure that indicates your ability for your business to sell goods and make sales, but it's not the ability to generate profit. I see businesses that have really great sales, but they don't make any money. It's not good. So let's discuss how to lower our overheads. That's the first one we're gonna cover, okay? So let's order our current suppliers and vendors. It could be products and services, internet, telephone, office supplies, janitorial services, insurance, garbage pickup, repairs and maintenance. Done it again. Okay. Cancel unnecessary dues and subscriptions. You know, I go to business and I look at their banks, uh, at their uh, credit card statement, and sometimes they've got two or three. And when I go through them, the numbers of subscriptions that are on there that they pay for every month, never query, and they never use. Get rid of them. Eliminate overtime if possible. Sometimes you just got to readjust the time schedules of your staff. In fact, I'm working with a restaurant at the moment. I'll probably talk about it a little bit today. I just saved them $2,000 a week on their wages. They had quiet times of the day, say between um, 10.30 and 12 and between 2.30 and 5, had two people in front of house, which is like the, 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 the wait staff, hanging around doing nothing. So we cut them back and you know what, over seven days it amounts to a lot of money, $2,000 a week, that's $100,000 a year, I just saved them. Refinancing debt, now <clears throat> this is not so easy at the moment and the reason is because the interest rates keep going up. However, you can do it. Replace travel with video conferencing, saves time. Set up results-based compensation model. 
<laughs> well, you pay people on a, on a um, results-based uh, efforts. Lease versus own. And I get asked this all the time. Will I lease it or will I buy? Here's the rule. If it appreciates, you buy. So if it's an office office you want, or if it's... Uh, I'm just okay. So if it's an um, office or a factory, you would buy it because what you're going to pay it off at will probably be no more than the rent and eventually you'll own it. If it depreciates, lease it. So if it's a car, a computer, lease it. A lease computer, you can constantly upgrade forever. So that's another way to save some money. Investigate outsourcing or in-house services. Accounting, bookkeeping. Accountants don't like me to say this, but it's true. Maintenance and repair, contractor versus employee. So you can save salary often with a full-time VA from the Philippines or other countries as well for probably, you can get one for probably 500 a month. The same type of person in Australia would probably cost you 5,000 a month for good saving. So here's the rule. If it's an expense and it doesn't help you acquire a new customer, or doesn't help you look after the one you already have. Dump it. Dump it. Let's move on to lowering cost of goods. Now, before we discuss ways to lower cost of goods, <laughs> excuse me, let's examine some of the factors that affect the cost of goods. Misunderstood pricing all the time. Discounting, bad. Supplier price increases. And I'm not going to cover this further, I will the others, but so when a supplier puts up the price and say they put it up 10%, this is what happens. Half the time the business owner doesn't realise they put it up 10% because they don't send out a message, they just put it up. So you need to find it first and then you need to put your price up to match it. So if your supplier puts the price up 10%, do you put yours up 10%? No. You've got to put it up 10% plus your margin on that 10%. So that means if your margin's 40%, You've got to put it up 10% plus your margin 40%. <laughs> Otherwise, your gross profit margin is going to fall down the toilet. Warranty and return. So this gets back to productivity and quality control. See, so much of it where just people are slack, they don't have proper procedures in place, and they just lose a lot of money. Scrap and waste. Let me talk about scrap and waste. Waste. So I'm working with this um, um, restaurant again at the moment, and um, and this is this is more um, um, inventory, I suppose. But let's go. So what they did, they had a standard order for milk. They used to get 60 crates of milk every week, standard order. Every week they'd throw 15 to 20 crates away because they were out of date but they still kept doing it. How do you do that? But, so we've just saved them a heap of money there. The other thing they did was their, their, um, their aprons. They used to have 180 aprons ordered as a standard order every week. They were flat out using 25 to 30. Just waste. And, and you just wonder how they don't realise, but stuff I found. Um, <clears throat> it says inventory is another thing. I worked with a, uh, uh, an automotive uh, business not that long ago, he had all this uh, inventory stock on his shelf, like oil filters and air cleaner filters and um, um, all sorts of uh, spark plugs and um, what do they call them today? Those other, it doesn't matter. But all this stuff on his, but you know what, a card come in for, and they want the same things he's got on the shelf, he'd just go and order them again. Like, just crazy. Money just sitting there, not making you any money. Misunderstood pricing is another thing. So say you're gonna sell a widget, it costs you $100 for the material and $75 for the labor. That's $175 cost of goods. We all agree with that. Cool. So the client wants to make 35% on each one he sells. So the price is 175, he multiplies by 1.35, that's 35%, right? He gets to $236 dollars and 25 cents is that correct if you think it's right put one in a chat box for me if i think it's wrong put two everyone's left 
that one's here. Okay, so let's have a look. It's wrong. And why is it wrong? Because here, you must use the inverse to calculate the proper uh, retail price. So if it's $175, you've got to divide it by 0.65. You see that? 0.65 by 0.35 make up one. $269.23. So if you did it the first way, you just lost $33 on every widget you sold. Great way to lose money. What about discounting? Who thinks discounting is a great way to get more sales? If you think it is, put one in the chat box. If you think it's not a good idea, put two. Ooh, lots of two, good book. Well done, look, and I'm gonna show you why. And this is what people just don't understand. Now we're gonna get that, we got that same widget, all right? We're gonna sell it for $100. And we're going to discount it 10% and sell it for just $90 instead of 100. So your cost of goods still remains at $70, right? Well, I didn't tell you that to start with, but it does. So it was originally $70, we're going to sell it for 100. We're going to discount it to 10% to $90 instead of 100, but it still costs 70. So now we're making only $20 profit instead of 30. You realize that's a 50% drop in your net profit? They now have to sell 50% more widgets just to get back your original profit margin. Have a look here, you'll see what I mean. So you sell 100 widgets at $30 to make $3,000. That's our original price, $30 profit. Now you have to sell 150 widgets at $20 to make $3,000. Now just think about that for a minute. For a measly 10% discount, you now have to sell 50% more just to break even. What a great sales process. When was the last time you saw someone only offer a 10% discount? Normally they're offering 25 to 40% discounts and wonder why the hell they go going broke. Okay, some additional factors to consider that impact the cost of goods. How am I going for time, Nick? Right. Warranty and returns. So yeah, um, increases in material and labor. Um, so this happens usually through bad productivity, uh, bad quality control and uh, people lose a lot of money. Now this is um, scrap and waste, which I told you about before. The other thing with that restaurant with the waste is they used to buy this steak in this great big piece and they'd try and cut it into 300 gram and 100 gram pieces. Sometimes the 300s would be 350, the 100s would be 80 or 120. And what, and they just used to have so much waste. So what we, what we found is we could buy it cut to size at a less kilo rate than what they were paying for it in bulk. How about that? Did we save them some money there? In fact, with this restaurant, with their wages, we saved them just over 2,000 a week. And with their waste, we've saved them just over 2,000 a week. That's 200 grand. It's not a bad saving for the one business in a, about a month I've been there. Uh, so excess inventory, which is just ties up funds, which is what I said before about the auto guy. He had all this stock on the shelf and kept buying in the same stuff. It just doesn't make sense, but it happens. It just happens. You need to be aware of it. So a combination of all these factors could easily lead to a 10% increase in cost of goods. Now, remember, we're only looking to reduce cost of goods by 5%. But with that restaurant, I've reduced their cost of goods by something like 40%. 40%. Amazing. All right, what about revenue? Now, most businesses that I talk to, when I first talk them, they want to increase their revenue. They want more sales and want more customers. Is that really the key? Let's have a look. Six ways to increase your revenue. What about increase your prices? <coughs> it's the simplest, most easiest way to increase your revenue and your profit. Every dollar you increase your price, goes into your pocket. It's your bottom line profit. So if you put your price up 20% and say it was a widget for $100 and you put it up 20%, that's $20. That $20 is net profit in your bank because you know more to, to produce it, sell it or anything. It's the greatest way. In fact, I recently worked with uh, 
uh, Sean and uh, Tanya from Gold Coast Budget Plumbing, and we put their prices up 40%. They said it won't work. I said, watch, it'll work. They never lost a sale. In fact, they actually increased their number of sales and, and made more money. Sell more stuff. Well, there's lots of ways to do that. Um, you can just have more product. I'll cover that more in a little bit. What about reignite old clients? <coughs> Sean and uh, Tanya with the plumbing business, they had about three and a half thousand clients on their database. I said, what do you guys do with these clients? They said, what do you mean? I said, what do you do with the clients? They said, well, nothing. I said, well, you realize that there's gold in there? Do you know that it costs five times as much to get a new client as it does to sell the one that you already got? Hear what I just said? So what we did is we set up an email marketing program for them with a CRM and we sent out information every week on the different things they did. Because here's what happens with a plumber. And it happens with nearly everything. But with a plumber, customer comes, he's got a block drain. They go and fix the block drain. Away they go. They probably leave my card. But you know what? The card doesn't have everything they do. It's impossible to fit it all on there. So they, um, So that's it. So six months later, their hot water system goes. Well, what does the customer do? He doesn't think to ring Gold Coast Budget Plumbing. He goes to Google, pops in a hot water system, and he finds someone else. However, if his client already knew that they did hot water systems, who do you think they're going to ring? They're not even going to go to Google. This works terrific. In fact, I can usually increase most businesses if they've got a good database by anywhere to 30 40% just with that. Upsell and cross sell. So, you know, upsell, we all know what upsell and cross sell. You know, when you walk into McDonald's and the kid says, you know, would you like your meal supersized? That's an upsell. And then when he says, would you like an apple pie to go with your supersized meal? Well, that's a cross sell. And it works in everything. In fact, I'll tell you something about um, McDonald's. Do you realize in 2021, during COVID, you want fries with that created a billion dollars. Listen to this number, one billion dollars in profit, not sales for McDonald's. And admittedly, that's worldwide, but that's an amazing number. So it works really good. Joint venture partners. I'm not going to go into this a lot, but joint venture partners work really good. You just have to find the right sort of person. So it's another business that has the same type of client that need and want what you sell, but they're not your competitor works both ways and it's a great way to grow your business. Introduce more products or services. So what do I mean? So <laughs> say you're a landscaper and you do gardens and mowing and whatever, uh, hedge trimming and stuff. What if you went into pool cleaning and pool fences? Going to grow your business and you already got the clients because the clients who use you for the mowing and stuff will have the pool. It's a great way. Trade shows, these were really good for a lot of businesses, not everything. I used to run four different PETA suspension stores at one time and uh, trade shows were amazing. We could do thirty dollars to $40,000 in a two day trade show, amazing. Strategic marketing, this one I love. Takes time and money and everything I've showed you today, you didn't need any marketing, but let's have a look at marketing because when I go to business owners, they always want more customers and more revenue, and they think that marketing is the way. They spend money on marketing, but what happens is, I'm going good for time, what happens is, is they spend money on marketing, and they do get sales from it, but they don't get enough to cover their costs. So it's wasted, and they think marketing doesn't work. That's not true. I'm going to cover this first. Uh, I've got the slides out of roll out of date, doesn't matter. So small businesses have never considered raising their price. We spoke about prices before, I just want to quickly show you this. Most businesses are scared to death to raise their price, no matter how small, they fear that they're going to get a mass exodus of their customers. But is that really true? Well, let's have a look. Let's say you sell a widget for $100 and it costs $70, the same widget we had before. So we decide to increase the price by 10% to $110. Will that small increase really lead to a loss of customers? I don't think so. The business is now making an additional $10 profit on every one he sells. That's a 33% profit increase. So for this business to make $1,000 in profit selling their widget at $100 each, 
they would need to sell 33.3 widgets at $30. Do you agree with that? Cool. But by increasing the price 10%, they now only need to sell 25 widgets because we're now getting $40 profit per widget. So that's 25 by 40 is $1,000. So that means to just to break even, this business could lose 25% of its customers over a measly 10% price increase. Simply is not going to happen. It's the easiest thing to do is raise your price. Okay, so let's go back to our marketing. Now, remember when we worked before with our 555 formula, the 5% increases and decreases in the three numbers on your profit and loss? <coughs> we increased the revenue by $46,000, right? So let's work out how much we'd have to spend on marketing to create the same sort of profit. So at 40% GP means that for every dollar in sales, you only get 40 cents profit, correct? So that's $46,000. You divide it by 0.4, which is a profit margin, equals $115,000. So to generate a $46,000 profit increase with marketing, you would have to get an extra $115,000 in sales. And remember that was on $500,000 revenue. So that's around about 22% increase in sales. That's a fair bit. And there we go. So that's what we'd have to do, 115,000 in, in we'd have to get an extra sales to get our 46% profit. So to generate that marketing, you would need to increase your revenue by 115,000. I've got it there twice. And that assumes that your marketing program is for free. And I don't know where you get marketing for free. If anyone knows, would please tell me. So marketing is not always the answer. Most businesses immediately turn to marketing as a primary way to quickly increase their revenue and profits. In most cases, marketing takes time to generate meaningful results and therefore is typically a cost involved when executing a marketing program. It costs money. However, in saying all that, I'm an absolute believer of marketing. The trouble with marketing is it needs to be the right marketing. Most people market like their competitor. They need to market different. They need to create their point of difference, what I call a market dominating position. Set your business apart from your competitor and it will work 10 times better. However, if you are a new business, you absolutely need marketing because you can have the best product or service in the world, but if no one knows about it, you're never gonna sell it. In my uh, book, The International Best Seller, How to Create Your Million Dollar, Million Dollar Business, I say in there, the chapter is called, Marketing is the Key to Your Success. But when you do the marketing and get it right and you get all these other things happening right, your business will grow exponentially. I'm happy to answer any questions, but just make them easy because I don't like hard ones. I'll stop the share and I'll come back and talk to you. The other thing, we, I spoke to you about the 555. Five, five. Imagine if you had 10, 10, 10, which I, you can see from what I've just done that it's not hard to get 10, 10, 10. You can go and do it yourself. And 10, 10, 10 doesn't create a $46,000 <laughs> increase in profit, but it creates about a $93,000 increase in profit. And uh, that's easy. So, But when I work with clients, I usually get something like, a 300% increase in profit, because that's my target. Someone must have some questions. I didn't explain it back. I, I, I've got a question, Ken. Kevin. Yep. Um, yeah, look, um, <clears throat> in the business, you know, if you've got two tiers of selling, you know, one yep. to uh, um, what you might call wholesale. Yeah. And, and the retail. Other one, retail. Yep. So how are we working the figures using those two? Well, it's just the same. You'll just have two two levels, you know. Um, so with the with the price, you can increase both prices by five percent, and your cost is going to be the same. So what you sell retail and what you sell wholesale, cost will be the same price. Is that right? You don't have two cost prices. You only got two sale prices. That's right. Yeah. 
So you'll just um, you'll just um, cut your cost of goods on 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 the products, whatever they are, and your expenses will be the same. There'll be no difference. So you'll only have retail. I used to run um, four different Petter suspension stores, and we used to sell retail uh, to the trade customers, uh, wholesale to the trade customers, and retail. And um, yeah, it's the same thing. Um, yeah, but when you, uh, you know, if you're thinking about it simply, your, your wholesale is really a discount, isn't it? On a retail well, it is, price. but you need to have that because that's where you're at. So say, say for instance, we go to the $100 widget and you sell it trade at 25% markup, which makes it 125, but you sell it retail, like 30% retail, I just did those numbers, but to make 30% retail on, on a product for $100, if you sell it for 150, it'd be too cheap. Because not enough, because if you sell a $100 product for $150, it's only 33% profit margin, you realize that? Mm -hmm. Need to sell it for 200. Everybody's afraid to put the price up. But you know, I'll tell you a story. When I had the Petter suspension stores, I went to a Michael Gerber seminar. It was in Brisbane at the old Sheridan Hotel in uh, Albert, not Albert Street. What's that street? Elizabeth Street or whatever it is. Not Elizabeth either. I can't think. Um, doesn't matter. Um, it was at old Sheridan. And he had about 300 odd business owners in the room. And um, he said, I want you to all go home and put your prices up because, you know, we all, the person who has the biggest problem put their price up is the business owner. The customer doesn't know any different, but you do. So I want you all go home and put your prices up. So I went home to, I had three stores at the time, three Petter stores. I went back and I said to the boys, I said, I'm going to put prices up, but we're going to test it. So what we did is we did wheel alignments. I said, all right, so we used to do, uh, a trade wheel alignment was $15 and a retail wheel alignment was $20. I said, we're going to put them to $20 for trade and we're going to put them to um, $30 for retail. I think it was $30. Uh, what did I say? 15 and 20, yeah, we put them to 30. And that's a 40% increase in price. The boys said to me, we'll never sell another wheel alignment. Well, I'll tell you what happened. I said, we're going to measure it every month and see. Not only did we get more money, our number of wheel alignments went up every month, every month. And you know what else happened? Everybody else in town put their prices up too because we led the way. Isn't that interesting? And you know what we saw more? People perceive better value. And that's what we forget. Perception of price is in your mind and it's different in the customers. Now, there'll always be people that will always shop the cheapest price. They're probably not your best customer anyway. You don't want them because they'll be the first ones to complain, grizzle and whatever. They're never going to be your best customer. So, you know, that's my philosophy on price and I know it from experience. Sean and and um, and um, Tanya with that plumbing business. When I said, "Look, we're going to have to put the price up," this, I said, "That's a forty percent increase. Do you think you're going to have a problem?" He said, "Oh shit!" He said, "I don't think we can sell it for that." She said, "No, I'm on the phone." She said, "I'll be able to do it." Well, she did it. You know why? Because she didn't think about the old price. She just told them the new price. So the price was like they were charging sixty-six dollars for a call out. And um, and twenty five dollars for every fifteen minute increment. So we put it. We didn't put the call out price up. We've only put it up sixteen percent to seventy seven. But but the but the fifteen minute increment we put from twenty five to thirty five dollars. That's a forty percent increase. They never lost a sale. In fact, their business grew in numbers after that. Isn't that interesting? Now there was other things affected it, like you know I told you about the follow them up their old clients, that obviously helped grow the number of clients as well. But when you got more clients coming in at a higher price, your business just go Do you think it's easier to put prices up now in this climate that we're in? Yep, I'll tell you something about this climate we're in. I reckon we're definitely in for a recession. <laughs> I think it'll be a bad recession. There's a lot happening in the world that people don't realise. They've all got their head in the sand. From my experience, I've been through at least four recessions, maybe five, I can't think, I don't want to tell you how old I am. But anyway, I'm going to tell you that the businesses who get off their bum now and make their business bulletproof will be survived and they'll even grow more. The ones that don't will disappear and that's what happens every time.
uh, when, when it gets tough, the uh, business owners are fearful of um, meeting the market. Kevin, I got it. Price, price will not be what drives you down, trust me. Thanks, Kevin. Oh, I've got a question there from Joe. I know you've been waiting for a while there. Sorry, uh -huh. Joe. Yeah, uh, very good presentation. Uh, so a couple of um, sub questions. So where do we stop once you increase the price and um, let's say we got the new normal yeah. and uh, where do we increase our second stage pricing that after few years it'll depend right it'll depend on how things are going um that's something you need to look at on a constant basis right i'll tell you what happens sometimes when you put the price up the competitor follows you mm -hmm. all right yeah because you become the leader that's what happens in business people follow the leaders other businesses follow the leaders true story oh. You see what yeah. I mean? Like what I said about the pedestal, where I put the price of the wheel on up. All the other places in town put their, their prices up as well. Right. But we still yeah. grew the numbers. We grew more numbers of clients getting a wheel alignment. And because in a pedestal, the wheel alignment's like the, the bait to get you in, find the problem, and then sell you the problem, the fix to the problem, right? The wheel alignment. People only come for a wheel alignment when they've got an issue, right? Mm -hmm. So when we check the wheel lump, we find out the problem because we get a chance to look at the car and then we can say, you know, the problem you've got with this or this or this, this is what needs to be done. And nine times then you get the job, nine times out of 10 we got the job because we did it the right way. We explained to them properly what the problem was and how it was going to fix it. You know, it's same with marketing. You know, the key to marketing is you've got to sell the problem the customer has that they don't want. You hear what I just said? Yeah, yeah. Marketing, yeah. that's the key. You don't say, my name's uh, Fred Blob Plumbing and I've been in business 20 years and we're reliable and we're honest and we're fantastic. Who cares? What are you yeah. going to do for me? You know, the old WIFM, what's in it for me? That's what customers yeah. want to know, right? So that's yeah. how you got to market. It's so important, but people don't do it. The, the second part is cost of good sale. Uh, yes. Let's say we introspect um the statement and we found the bad ones uh but it's always uh the the it is gonna creep in back again isn't it so is that um a business coach always need to be in the uh, in the team uh is that to get the to get it in a sustainable well, manner what i find is um when business owners have worked for me with say for say a year or so they get the drift and they know how to do it themselves, you know, because what I do is I teach them how to do it properly, right? So with cost of goods, you got to keep your eye on it. You know what I mean? Like I said before, you know, when the supplier puts the price up, if you don't pick it up, you're in trouble. You see? Not not hard for a supplier to put the price up 10%. And if you didn't realise it, you're already paying it and you haven't factored it into your price. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's mm. right um okay yeah uh that's good uh third one what sort of business is i know you mentioned you know all the business are the same but uh is that more to medium business where this sort of problem happens and where we get this sort of introspection get it more value? most yeah. businesses i'd say between up to two million dollars turnover um yeah. With anything from one to ten staff, that's who has the biggest problem. And I'll tell you why a lot of it is: is they might be really good at what they do. I'll tell you what happens. Uh, let's just pick a plumber, right? We're talking about plumbers. Let's pick a plumber. Goes and he does his apprenticeship. He becomes a plumber. He's a really good plumber. Uh, he's working for the boss. The boss giving him the craps a bit, you know. He's going, oh, this boss, I hate him. I'm going to go and start by myself. So he goes and start by himself. He's a fantastic plumber. But he never learned how to run a business, and that's the problem. And do you know that today, according to the Bureau of Statistics, Australian Bureau of Statistics, 86% of small businesses fail in the first three years. And three reasons. The three reasons they give is lack of business fundamental knowledge, lack of lack of marketing knowledge, and lack of capital. And that's the three. And I just sort of covered two of them. Hmm. So that that's probably my business buying venture. That sort of business I should be targeting, isn't it? 
Well, you need to, if you're going to buy a business, you need someone to look at because I'm going to tell you, it's really easy to buy a business that's no good. It looks good on the outside, but it's not good on the inside. People have a horrible fact of lying with their numbers. Right. Yep. You need to have someone to look at. It's really important. Do you, do you offer that sort of services? In a yeah, I do that a lot. I do that a lot. I just tell the guy, well, I didn't just, it was about nearly four years ago, I helped him buy a wrecking yard in Brisbane called Underwood Wrecking. They wanted 150000 for it. I went and looked at it for him. I said, this, this is terrible, this thing. The stock's terrible. I said, don't pay that. He said, what do you think it's worth? I said, 50000 He said, I, I couldn't offer 50000 I said, well, I'll do it for you. No, don't offer 50000 He said, he was embarrassed to offer it, but it doesn't worry me. I just tell him what it's worth. He said, let's do 75. I said, okay. So I offered 75. They couldn't sign the contract fast enough. So he bought it for 75 and was doing about $12,000 a week and losing money. Um, so I helped him with it. We implemented a marketing plan. We implemented a lot more strategies. We did free delivery and we did a lot of things that we could upsell and, and not only upsell, but sell as a point of difference. Uh, and we're only selling second-hand parts in this place. So I worked with him for three years. We took it from 600000 to $1.8 million. I said, it's time to sell it. You know, he said, I don't want to sell it. I don't want to sell it. Anyway, about, what's this, so July, about November, his wife got cancer. Went through all the stuff, so he's all in a mess. Lost his manager because he was not doing everything properly and everything fell to bits. His life was a mess. Anyway, he's just sold it. He got 430 for it. He probably could have got 650 for it before, but he just got 430. So he still did all right. But um, yeah, so I felt sorry for him because of his wife. But, you know, we helped him sell it and uh, think the new owner is going to take me on board as well. So there you go. Oh, thanks for sharing, Kevin. Good work. So awesome. I've got, I could tell you a million stories, <laughs> but. All right, now I've got a question in chat there, uh, Kevin, from uh, Bill, who says, uh, what do you recommend for a franchise business, say pest control? It's the same rules. Look, I'm going to tell you, I've had franchises. I had four petter suspension stores. They're all franchise, best franchise ever. So let me tell you a story. Again, I shouldn't tell you all this. I had uh, two petter suspension stores, and there was one in Bundaberg, the guy... Uh, bought it it was going fairly good when he bought it not terrific but it was going okay would have been making money anyway just run it down run it down didn't know what he was doing they come to me said you want to buy my petters i said look you want too much for it i said you, you've got no numbers you know i said it's terrible you're not going to sell it to anybody and he said well how much will you pay i said i'll give you seventy thousand. he said no oh, it's worth a lot more than that i said well to you but not to anybody else anyway about three months later i bought it off him for seventy thousand. It had probably a hundred thousand worth of planting equipment and stock. It was doing seventeen thousand dollars a month, and I'm going to tell you, it probably needed to be doing thirty to break even. I bought that of him on the first of July, nineteen ninety nine, I think it was, and by the thirtieth of July, I'd done sixty five thousand. That's not a bad turnaround. That's a franchise. So I'll tell you what happened. Ron Petter, who was the master franchise of that, he's become a personal friend of mine. He said, Kevin, can you come and talk to all our other franchisees and tell them what you do to do this? I said, sure. So I went and did a talk to about 10 franchisees, all the Queensland ones, and I told them what I did step by step, pretty simple. I always keep stuff simple. No, I you know, I'm not, not high tech. I'm straight down the line. Tell them all what to do. And you know what happened? Not one of them did any of it. And guess what? They're all still the same. So, but so franchises are the same. Sometimes the disadvantage with the franchise, um, like I help the guys from, I don't know if you know Steve and, uh, and Melinda Costa from um, Go Bins Gold Coast. They bought that as a franchise. It was a Jim's uh, Skip Bin franchise. I'd had it for a year. They'd lost about 40,000. Jim's was doing nothing for them. They're just paying them a fee every month. They're getting one or two leads a week, which is nothing. 
Anyway, they said, you know, what do you think we can do? I said, let's have a look. So we had a look. I said, well, gyms are doing nothing. Well, I think just dump gyms. So we dumped gyms and they took that business in about 18 months, or a bit less, I think, but from doing 220 grand, losing 40 grand a year to 1.13 million, they went from one truck that was busy a third to half of the time to two trucks flat out. And they've just recently bought their third truck and she still rings me and said, Kevin, I want to do this. What do you think? Because that's the rapport I built with them. So franchises uh, do work, but not all. But it's the same rules still apply in the franchise. It's just some franchisors aren't very, um, aren't very good at doing what they should do. Does that answer the question? Excellent. Hopefully it does. There's a lot of pest control franchises around. Like I think most of them aren't too bad from the ones I've looked at. But you know, I'd need to look at it properly to be able to tell you for sure. But um, but some of them aren't too bad. Um, it depends which one. But there's a lot of them. But you know, pest control is something. There's plenty of work out there for all the time. But you need to be good at doing um, termites. You need to be good at detecting termites if you're in pest control that day. Excellent. Any last uh, questions there before we uh, wrap up for tonight and uh, bring in the uh, the prize draw for tonight? So don't go yet. Prize draw is still coming. Any last questions? Going once, going twice. Boom. Sold. All right. That's it for tonight. So uh, thanks, Kevin, for uh, for that. Your your um, presentations are always good and uh, always compelling to uh, watch. And um, uh, hopefully everyone got a whole heap of value. If you got a heap of value out of it, let's give uh, Kevin a virtual round of applause. All right, lots of applause there. So, oh, uh, someone's asking, how do we contact uh, you, Kevin? If anyone wants to uh, get in touch with uh, you. I'll put in here. Oops, can't spell. that work? There That's my yeah. calendar link. So you can jump on that and book a time with me and I'll give you a call. Um, Cost nothing to ever talk to me, it's free. Excellent, thank you. And uh, of course we do have a door prize for tonight as well too. Do you want to tell us what that is, Kevin? It's uh, my uh, international best-selling book, How to Create Your Million Dollar Business uh, Using Seven Explosive Strategies. Um, and I'm going to sign it for whoever wins it as well and we'll Thanks. post it so all we need is your address and we'll post it to you so you got a real copy excellent all right well we've got a special way of drawing this with our wheel of name so let's bring that up on screen now and i've got everybody's uh, name in the um in the wheel so let's uh, spin the wheel uh for this uh best-selling book of uh kevin's which if uh, tonight's anything to go by, uh, there are some uh, good strategies in there to uh, make it work. All right, and our lucky winner is Jacqueline Price. How are you? You still here, Jacqueline? Yes, I'm still here. Thank you very much. <laughs> I put it out there. I was going to win. <laughs> well done. Uh, well, it obviously Thank worked. You you, uh, you have influenced the uh, wheel of names there. So well done. Thank you. We will um, uh, introduce you, we'll email you um, to both you and Kevin tomorrow. So then you can swap details and address and all that so that uh, uh, Kevin will Thank see you through that uh, signed copy. Excellent. Well, congratulations. Congratulations, right, well, Jacqueline. Sorry? Congratulations. Thank you very much. Looking forward Excellent. to reading it. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Well, that is our uh, session for tonight. Uh, so thanks again, Kevin, for uh, coming along tonight and uh, sharing your uh, uh, business wisdom tonight. I no know problem. that uh, everyone got uh, heaps out of it uh, tonight. If you um, if you want to watch this again, it will be up on the Smashco YouTube channel uh, tomorrow afternoon. So you can tune in tomorrow afternoon and uh, catch it there. And um, if you uh, are not a member of the Business Owners Smashing Online Facebook group, uh, now's the time to go and uh, join that. We have the uh, link in chat as well. 
uh, have the link in there for the uh, smash go uh, youtube channel as well too so best thing to do is go and subscribe to the channel when you do subscribe to it there's a little bell that pops up to the right hand side of the button click the bell and then you'll get a notification to uh, let you know that the uh, video has been uh, uploaded so uh, that's it for uh, this week uh, next week we have a uh, another presenter uh, coming through ne next week and uh, that's all about how to save your time in business uh, and uh, she's going to be talking about uh, business processes and uh, uh, VA or how to hire VA. So Kevin touched on that um, uh, in as one of his points tonight. Uh, but she's going to be talking about uh, onshore and offshore VAs too. What's the difference? How to use them and how to work with it with your systems and processes. And that big question, how to actually prepare your business for a VA as well too. Okay. All right. Well, that is it for tonight. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everyone, for uh, coming along. And uh, I look forward to catching you next Thank week. You. Good night.